everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. It is so nice to see all of you here and to celebrate this last week of the expired exhibition. My name is Maya Benton. I'm the curator of the show, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here to Sarah Kay Gallery. Um, Sarah was so generous in giving us this space to experiment with this new approach to looking at photographers, a wide range of photographic practices, engaging with the question of um, materiality and historicity and expired materials in five radically different ways. I am so grateful to Sarah for giving me her gallery to, to play with these new ideas. This is the second in a series of exhibitions that we'll be doing together to celebrate our 20 years of friendship. So it's been a, a great gift to work with one of my best friends and to be able to have her gorgeous gallery to start to think about new approaches to photography and materiality. And I want to thank Susan for being the first artist of the five whom I had conversations about the show and it was just a germ of an idea. And she was so in and ready and flexible to kind of go with me on this journey as I started to think about this show. Um, Alison Rossiter is here who's responsible for this gorgeous wall and it's just nice to see so many familiar faces. I also um, want to ask all of you to um, bless you. Thank you. Um, to ask questions at the end because this is, I think, an ongoing and bigger project. We're going to be turning this into a bigger museum exhibition that will travel. There's already been some interest from institutions. So it would be great to have rigorous engagement with these questions of expired photographic materials. And in this moment where there has been this massive digital turn, a lot of photographers are returning to these laborious 19th century artisanal practices of making tintypes or daguerreotypes, but other artists, and including the five here, are looking at the kind of material artifacts of early photographic practices and kind of reanimating them and revivifying them in five radically different ways. So I'm excited to introduce Susan Makula, who works with old and new technologies. She embraces the unpredictability of expired Polaroid film and vintage Polaroid cameras constructing her work within rigorous self-imposed limits. These rules, these requirements, work like form in a poem or true likeness in a painted portrait. Fulfilling the requirements allows a specific kind of beauty to emerge, one in which an old camera and an empty hallway produce a picture that is both familiar and out of reach. Christopher Bonanos is the city editor of New York Magazine, where he writes and edits stories about urban affairs and culture. He's the author of Instant, the Story of Polaroid, and Flash, The Making of Ouija the Famous, the New York Times Best Art Book of 2018 and winner of the National Book Critics Circle Award for Best Biography of 2018. When Susan and I started talking about her work, she immediately talked about Christopher's <laughs> writing and um, how their relationship was central to kind of informing her practice as it evolved. So to have them both in conversation here today is a great gift and I'm looking forward to the conversation and to hearing more from all of you. Thank you both. Well, I guess, I guess you're good. <laughs> I have to say, you know, you can't, you can have an outdoor event and you cannot control the weather, but when it is a beautiful day, you just feel like the magic has happened and that was what this show was like for me, which is you cannot control what the other artists are like what their work is like, what the curator is like, what the gallerist is like. And they're 201, kind and warm and smart. And so that, and it was, that alone has made this one of my favorite experiences in terms of being out in, in a show situation. That's super exciting. Now, nice I'm, now I'm done talking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, just to fill people in, I thought, okay. let's do some nuts and bolts stuff. Tell them about your particular, the particular way you made the photos that were in the show. Uh, just the background of the project and what you shot them on and so forth. So, there okay. goes first. And also, you know I like to talk about gear. We'll, we'll do plenty of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I work in Polaroid, with Polaroid cameras because I personally revere Edwin Land. And I think that the, especially the SX-70, um, was a defining feature of the last century, and in many, many more ways than just instant photography. Um, just to just to play prop comic for a moment, if you don't know, <laughs> this is an SX70 camera. It opens up like that. This was the the. Is that a, is that a model? This is an alpha. Alpha, yeah. Um, see the 
camera people was it? I know. Um, the, this was the, uh, the uh, flagship product of Polaroid starting in 1972. This was their fancy, expensive model, and it is still a very fine photographic instrument, um, and ahead of its time in many ways, <coughs> behind our time, and ahead of our time in many ways. That's all true. Continue. And oh, I, believe, I believe all of those things. Um, and I, I like to work with these cameras I mean, this is one of my favorites, but it's not certainly not the only one. I love using a spectra. I love the crazy angle of the spectra, and I think that it produces a really interesting photograph. And those are the two cameras that were used in these series. So uh, the more squarish format is always an SX70, uh, although it's not exactly square, <laughs> and um, uh, just to annoy people. And the uh, spectra is the wide format. And uh, I work in... Um, although I have <laughs> occasionally lit my photos, I almost always use natural light. And in both of these cases, I use natural light. That is a natural indoor light, and that was outdoor. And um, the um, On Cruising Cloud was a um, commission from the State Department for um, art and embassies. And when they called me and asked me if I'd be interested I was like, oh yes, I'm, I'm super excited. And they were like, well, we'll we parcel out uh, the places that we want people to take a picture, we'll get back to you. And, uh, and I thought, oh, it could be anywhere. And they called me you know, two months later and they were like, we would like you to take pictures in Laredo, Texas, to hang in the new consulate in Nuevo Laredo, Mexico. And I was like, and I could tell that the woman who was telling me that was like, she, is she going to be disappointed? And I was so excited because it is exactly the kind of place that I would like to have a real reason to take pictures that are not just me rolling around the streets. <laughs> what would you say kind of characterizes the places that you like? Because I, I know what I see in the pictures, but I'm curious to hear you talk about it. Well, I think um, I really like places that people really are. Mm -hmm. So. Um, that means to me that they are not, they might not be groundbreaking as ideas in terms of, you know, these are streets, streets in an American town. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but there is a, I like a place that has a palpable feeling of the humans who are there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that was really Laredo. Um, uh, I'm Jill McDonough, who's a poet, she is also my driver in when I go to these places. <laughs> and, and partly it is, um, that's a safety issue. Um, that, the place where that was certainly true was um, uh, certainly Camden, New Jersey, which, which was one of the places that was the most frightening to take pictures in. Um, but it was also true in Laredo because um, people are very nervous because they are now in the, in the spotlight. And so it's a, a great place to, <clears throat> you can very easily offend people. And so to have somebody take me around uh, makes all the difference and also keeps the film cool. Mm -hmm. That's, well, there's lots to unpack there. I, I, what I notice in pictures of Laredo is that it has that sort of slightly fried landscape that reminds me of you, an earlier body of work you are, of yours that is about sort of uh, wrecked factory landscapes mm -hmm. and burnt out industrial sites and Which was, places that have been sort of left for dead. Right. Well, that was all in the um, far south between New Orleans and um, Galveston. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if you sort of see any resonance between those and the same. I think so. I, I see these, this is, this is lovely stuff to me. Mm -hmm. I see these things as beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's easy to, it, and tr also true of all those oil refineries. Right. I, I was born in New Jersey, so. <laughs> same. <there's, laughs> maybe that's why I was born Maybe, that's too. right. That's you know, right. the ugly parts of Jersey that are actually <laughs> Kind of fabulous. I was trying to explain this to someone how the upper part of the turnpike has a certain beauty to it. That's right. And the person I was talking to said, Are you out of your mind? Oh, right. Could not, could not yeah. get his head around it. I see, I see a gas blow, burning off, and I'm like, Oh. That's for me. <laughs> <laughs> Other people want a magnolia tree. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, 
you talked about safety a little, and I am curious when you're shooting in places like this, how you how you deal with people with a camera. I mean, you said they get skittish, and I know when you're shooting industrial sites, you have to deal with guards and barbed wire fences and dogs and things like that. Um, is there any particular method, for lack of a better term? Well, I mean, oftentimes Jill blags our way out. Uh -huh. Right? Like she's like, oh, I'm so sorry, we didn't mean to be here. But like if I'm really, I mean, um, at the uh, Port of Long Beach, you know, I, I wasn't in a, I, I was taking pictures of a restricted area from a non-restricted area. Should be okay. Should be okay. Is it okay? Is it okay? <laughs> you know, they confiscated my pictures. Yeah. Um, and so to that end, I am mm -hmm. also removing them to a vehicle, mm -hmm. um, probably 10 at a time. So mm -hmm. you're, if you're taking what I have in my hand, you're only taking 10. Right. And so I try to think about that. But it is, um, you can't be, you can't sneak around. Yeah. It's not, these are big cameras. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of bags with a lot of stuff. I have all the film, I've got the trash that I make, mm -hmm. which is gonna ha then have to be separated out later. And so uh, I, can't, I don't try to hide really what I'm doing. I was gonna ask you about that because yeah, if, if you haven't shot with Polaroid, you don't quite grasp that it produces a certain amount of, my, my term of art is pull a crap. <laughs> um, if you shoot the earlier types of film that are peeled apart, you have to throw away the peelings. And if you shoot the later ones, it's a little simpler, but you have rejected pictures that you're stuffing in your pockets. And you have the card that comes out when you put in a new pack of film, and you have to deal with that. And the pack the itself. box right. that the film came in, and you're stuffing pictures into those, and they end up in every every pocket and in your car and in your wastebasket. You've seen this else. happens with me. <laughs> yes, I'm guessing that. But what I was going to say is you leave a trail. You can't yes. be stealthy. You can't be stealthy. But one thing you can do is you can um, offer to take a picture of someone and give it to and them. And give it to them, right? Even at my sort of amateur level, I have found that. And not only that, but um, it is a testament to the allure of the Polaroid. Mm. Yes. Because they can take a picture of themselves now. Mm -hmm. And it is still... A, it's a gatekeeper. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you agree with this, but what I always notice is it has two secret things. One is it, because you're taking it of them, it bonds you together. It's a, it's a, a little memoir of the moment you have. It's particularly if you're both in it. Totally transactional. That's right. And secondarily, it's a gift. You're giving a gift. Mm -hmm. And it's a one-of-a-kind gift, mm -hmm. because there's no negative and there's no digital file flying around. Yes. Right? If you give it to them, it's theirs. It's not yours anymore. You can't, you don't have it. Right. You, know. um, you mentioned getting in, into the car, and <laughs> for people who don't know, you should explain why that's a big deal. So, you know, one thing about uh, this film, I, it's already, I, I picked up a pack today to try to work with, it's 20 years old, and I got three good pictures out of 10. But that, that is now film that I've been keeping at a steady temperature, and uh, in, you know, not in a temperature controlled situation, except that it doesn't have extremes. But one thing that happens in a place like Laredo, it's 100 degrees and 100% humidity. And inside the car is where that film is happy. And now I'm taking it out of there and I'm, I'm shooting with it. And it can happen at the reverse end too. I shot in, uh, uh, on Valentine's Day in um, Meredith Bay, New Hampshire, and it was negative six degrees, and I got three pictures out of the camera before the camera seized up. Mm -hmm. And then I'd have to run into the Bob house <clears throat> and warm up the camera and then go back out. So because you are working with mechanisms and mechanisms that are, you know, 50 years old or 70 years old, you are, you are responsive to those mechanisms, and I think that that's a big part of it. To do the underarm thing? Oh yeah, yeah. This, this used to I be also just do I just do the uh, the bra strap thing. Yeah, that works for me. <laughs> <laughs> however, however, men's jackets have inside pockets right. on both sides, and it, it gets you halfway there. Um, the the uh, the, uh, the film itself is temperature sensitive. The cameras are temperature sensitive, and um, you know this. Some of you may know this. Polaroid in the in the in the sixties used to include with its camera a thing called a cold clip. It was two sheets of aluminum the little hinge, and you, after your picture came out, you would put it in between the little, make a little sandwich out of it, put it in between the pieces of aluminum, and it directed you to put it in your armpit. <laughs> under your, in, it specifies, it's written on the outside, under coat, <laughs> under your coat. Um, and that would keep it warm enough so that it would process. Right. Um, 
what kind of high technology includes <laughs> instructions that include the word armpit? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't really see that on an iPhone. No, that's right. Um, so I think you know. I think that that um, with the with the vehicle. One other thing is that I. I'm laying those flat in the back. Mm -hmm. um, we always get a vehicle that has a, you can put down the seat, and I have a big wide area that things are able to be flat until mm -hmm. they have to be moved. Mm -hmm. And you're shooting mostly SX-70 Spectra now. You don't do the peel apart stuff much. Anymore. I love doing the peel apart, but you know, I like, I love 669 and mm -hmm. all of those, but you know, it's a matter of getting it. There isn't much left. I have, I have some of that um, and, and really enjoy using it. Also, and I use it with pinholes. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Yeah. You like make your own pinhole? No, pinhole? I have. I have. Well, of uh, course, you have a lot of cameras. I have, <laughs> ca I have cameras, you know, like, like I have so many, I have to hide them. Yes. I, uh, I have a closet <laughs> my wife doesn't like to go into <laughs> because there's so, many, so much camera gear. Mm -hmm. I think it multiplies at night. <laughs> I, I wish. I, I wish that worked with Oh, yeah, source. right. Yeah. Get more. I was just working with some of the um, the three colored films, the blue, the chocolate. Oh yeah, I, I, I used the it. last of it. I, I don't have any of that left. This is at the very end of Polaroid's run in the uh, 2007 ish, yeah. right? They cranked up the factory to make one last run of film and they had vast amounts of it. And they goofed around a little. They made some runs of film where they used the development chemistry for color on black and white and the development chemistry for black and white on color. And what they got were these three odd flavors. One that everything came out sort of not black and white, but blue and white. One that came out brown and white, and one that came out sort of sepia. Sort of sepia, but really it reads as black and white. Right, kind uh, of. And in the and the chocolate reads more as sepia. Right. You know, but yeah, like those are those are a treat. And they're right. they're you know they made them for a few weeks or something, and we all hoarded it. Yes. <laughs> um, you talked about the mechanicalness of the camera and how it can be a problem in the cold or in the heat or something. Um, you could talk some more about that, I bet. You know, the particular quality of shooting with this touchy sort of device that's all gears and levers and, you know, a little motor. I love it so much. Um, I love the infinite adjustment. Mm -hmm. I can make any adjustment. And when I know my cameras, it, um, okay. Maya said, well, do you have a couple cameras that you could put in the vitrines? And I was like, what, what, what could I do without? Like, what, what one, you know, there's SX-70s, the lenses are so bad, you think these were ground by Woolworths. And there's lenses so good that you're like, this was ground by Zeiss. Like, you are just, it is a, it's a, a geological map of lenses that are, that each one is dear to me. I love all my children the same. I just, they're all, they all have a different use and the lenses are super important and the way the camera works. I, I have such beloved cameras that I know how long it's going to take for the picture to come out under certain light conditions because they're different. It's supposed to be right away, but mm -hmm. I know that this camera waits a second mm -hmm. and it's not going to be a problem. It's going to come out. Mm -hmm but it takes a little bit, and then there's the beautiful noise. Right. The noise, when I was working on the book about Polaroid, I talked to some of the old executives, and they over and over said something about the sound. I mean, if you haven't heard it in a long time, I'll give it a I once did a radio segment about this, and I got to do it into a really good microphone, and everybody went, oh. <laughs> you know. It's, you know. <laughs> and this 680, which um, is really was their Polaroid's photographer's camera. It was expensive when it was new, it was really hard to find. This is the same camera that's in the George Magenta sleeve. Yeah, this was the modified version of the one I showed you earlier. This was, I don't know, eight years later, something like that. And it was introduced as the sort of premium expensive one. This gadget on top is a sonar autofocus thing. But what it does is it, it, it sends out a sonar ping. It bounces it off Susan and back to the camera to tell how far away she was. And what you saw is that it will, it will spin the lens. And you can't see it in the back, but there you go. Um, 
and spin the lens to focus exactly right. But you can override it. Too. Yes, there's a manual with a, focus. With a very funny little, it's the funniest <laughs> little, switch. little switch. Yeah, it's I just know. a little switch. But at all, I appreciate that they made everything. You could override everything yeah. on every camera, even on the spectras with the flashes. You can turn the flash off. You can you can turn the focus auto focus off everything, and you are back to doing it completely yourself. Mm -hmm. For cameras that were supposed to take those problems away from the person who was creating. That's really true. The, 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 um, the founder of Polaroid, Edwin Land, who you mentioned earlier, and we'll talk about him a bunch. Let's talk about him. Let's now. talk about him. Now. Let's talk about him right away. Because uh, Edwin Land is my dead boyfriend. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and from what I've read, there, there, there were quite a, quite a few. <laughs> um, he, um, uh, you know, his, his goal in the creation of Polaroid photography in general and this system in particular was to eliminate, uh, he said, all barriers between photographer and subject. You should just be able to point it, look right through, and this is a single lens reflex, so you look through the lens. You see what the film is going to see. Um, so all you do is you point and you press a button. That's it. It's supposed to be as simple as the kind of photography we all do now on our phones. It isn't quite if the temperature is a little wrong or if the lens isn't turning quite right or whatever, but it was a little simpler when it was all new, I will say. Right. You weren't using it. It wasn't a 50 year old camera. Um, but most of all, he wanted that to be a seamless sort of part of your everyday life. And um, that said, he left all the controls available to you also <coughs> so you could take over. He, I think, didn't he say that he wanted to make it so that there was nothing between you and the ability to create? That's right. Yeah. He, um, he, he, um, he didn't even like the term instant photography because the speed wasn't what interested him. His term was one-step photography. That's what he preferred. And you can hear the difference there. Mm -hmm. It was about seamlessness, you know, what, what we, the tech people now say frictionlessness, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that was, I think, the point he was most interested in making. Let me ask you, um, I am pretty sure, but um, you're, the, you're the boss on this stuff, um, SX-70, isn't that also what the name of the nine, Model 95 was? Um, it was before the Model 95, that's right. The, the, uh, the term SX-70 was put on this camera in 1972 after a million rejected other names. Um, what it was was the name for the very first experimental project at the end of World War II that led to instant photography and the creation of Polaroid as a photo company. Before that, they've made other things, optics for the war and polarizing filters, that's where the name comes from. They had, over the course of the war, done experimental work for the, uh, what was then called the War Department, uh, the DOD now, and they had logged them. There had been 69 projects before that one, and in 1944, the end of the year, they started Special Experiment 70, um, which was devoted to making a picture that could happen on the spot. And 30 years later, when he felt they had finally achieved the goals of Special Experiment 70, he pulled out the old name and stuck it on the new camera. And that first camera, that was the Model 95. Right. Came and out like in 47. 40, introduced in 47, that's right. right. And Kodak was making negative, is that right? Still uh, on that Kodak one? was making components of the film, including the negative later, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, they were buying it from Kodak for the next 20 odd years, in fact. Um, it was sort of the dirty secret that their competitor was also their supplier. Right. Um, uh, Kodak, they, they, uh, Kodak didn't believe that Polaroid was any kind of competition. They said, that thing's a toy, we'll sell you anything you want. And then 15 or so years later, they started to say, well, wait a minute. <laughs> You're, you've suddenly got a third of our market share, right. and, uh, and this, this, this can't continue. And um, that I indirectly led to the creation of this camera, because they had to reinvent their film and the whole sort of system in such a way that they could do without Kodak. Right, then they had to actually be able to produce all those parts. Right. right. This leads very neatly to yes, this. Yes, I think it does. Um, Edwin Land in 1970, <coughs> Um, before the SX-70 camera was introduced, uh, made a short film for his shareholders about what was to come. Um, they had built a factory, but it was not yet fitted out to manufacture these cameras. And uh, for in, the shareholders... In Norwood, Mass. In Norwood, Massachusetts, that's right. All, almost all this stuff was made in and around Boston and Cambridge. The film came from Wal. If anybody's from Massachusetts, the film came from Waltham. The negatives came from New Bedford. The cameras came from Norwood. 
The offices and labs were in Cambridge itself, right near MIT. Um, Technology Square. All the old people were to refer to him as Dr. Land. Dr. Land. <laughs> it was an honorific. He was never. No. He never dropped out of college twice, <laughs> at least. Right. Um, but uh, but he's Dr. Land. Doctor Land. Yeah. Um, and anyway, in 1970, he made a little film uh, explaining sort of his philosophy and talking about the project that was to come. And it's it's long and and. Uh, not all of it is super interesting to a lay audience, although I ate it. I up. love it. It's 17 <laughs> minutes long, and it's fantastic. Right. So you should see the whole thing. It's, the whole thing's but, but this is a this is a two minute excerpt, and this is the one where he talks about the um, the future of photography as he sees it. You think we can get the lights down? It's yeah. a little hard to see. Hi, Edwin. <laughs> uh, I should note that. He comes off a little weird in this. He was magnetic in person, but a little strange for the camera. He looks down a lot, and he's walking around an empty factory in his coat. Um, so it's a little awkward. <laughs> Focus on the words rather than the manner. <laughs> why a factory of this complexity, automaticity? We have to go back to 1944 to the very first concept of a kind of photography that would become part of the human being, an adjunct to your memory, something that was always with you, so that when you looked at something, you could, in effect, press a button and have a record of it in its accuracy, its intricacy, its beauty, have that forever. Now that kind of camera implied a whole family of technologies which did not exist in 1944. And yet it is clear that as far as we have come, and as remarkable as that achievement seems to be, we are still a long way from the concept from the realization of the concept of a camera that would be, oh, like the telephone, something that you use all day long, whenever an occasion arises in which you want to make sure that you cannot trust your memory, or when you want to record any object of great interest to you, or any beautiful scene. A camera which you would use not on the occasion of parties only, or of trips only, or when your grandchildren came to see you, but a camera that you would use as often as your pencil or your eyeglasses. <laughs> they were a long way from the dream which I used to talk about then, of being able to take a wallet out of my pocket and perhaps open the wallet, press a button, close the wallet, and have the picture. <laughs> Why? Why? Um, you may recognize that gesture a little bit. <laughs> We do live in his world, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> and we had no ability to make that at that time. No. What's striking is that he, he filtered it all through an analog world. Mm -hmm. The one thing missing from the puzzle for him was any concept of a digital photograph. He really, even into the 1980s, was talking about sticking with uh, grains on film. That's how he understood it. He said, just you make it finer, and you make it better, and you make it smaller. He tried to make a Polaroid camera that was really you know, that big. Um, he had his engineers and scientists working on one and they couldn't quite carry it off because the, the object was so small that the lens is too close to the film. Um, you add that one piece to the puzzle and everything changes. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I think just seeing this level of genius is um, amazing when we get to the product of the SX-70 which is both beautiful and genius. 
And his idea that it was going to have actual design and be a lovely thing and be an inch thick and at that point also could fit in his pocket. So he was headed in that direction and that's 1972. Yeah. Didn't you say that he has he had the size? Yeah, he, he ordered it to be that size. He, he had a block of wood cut to the oh. size of his suit pocket. And he gave it to the engineers and said, make it fit in this. Yeah. Um, and, and it does. I mean, you can, even now, you can fit this in some of your pockets. I do pockets. carry it. Yeah. I mean, you need a coat or something. Right. But, you know, and it's heavy. Unfortunately, it I <laughs> tore a pocket. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you can do it. Just don't drop your coat too hard. That's right. And I was, um, I was uh, talking to Christopher about the release of the SX-70. And um, he said that it had, there were, there were 50 of them made. And they put them out at the... Uh, shareholders the shareholders party, that's right. There were 50 working cameras and they had about 48 of them on the floor. And, and they were swapping them in and, and out. And so you'd broke. have them, they would put one on each shareholders table group. Uh, they were having some problems with the colors on yes. the film. So, so, yes. go. so at, at the introductory meeting, uh, they, as, as she said, they, they, they were cameras set out for the shareholders to play with. And on each table there was a bowl of tulips, which had been flown in special at horrifying expense from Holland because it was April and it was too early for Massachusetts tulips. <laughs> um, the marketing director of Polaroid at the time was Dutch, and Lan had gone to him and said, you're Dutch, you know how to get tulips, right? <laughs> um, and the tulips were red and yellow. Why? Because the first batches of SX-70 film, the blue and green dyes were not quite right yet. <laughs> but the red was pretty good. So red and yellow tulips it was. <laughs> and I think, you know, that that speaks to um, a, a lot of things about photography itself, especially photography where you're counting on old cameras or you're counting on old film, is that you work within the boundaries that those things set for you. Oh, it's so true. Okay. You know, and that is one part of my practice, which is I know what those cameras are going to do, and I exploit that. I don't, and I know what that film is going to do, and I, I would say that very little of what I do is a happy accident, although I know that that is a thing that people like to believe about Polaroid. You know, it bugs me too, because people think of it as a snapshot medium, which yeah. it's a very good snapshot medium. But if you have the better cameras in particular, mm -hmm. and you know, some of the cheaper cameras are less good. Have, have a joy That's of right. their own. They're the best party cameras ever. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Absolutely true. Bring one to a, to a kid's party or something, mm -hmm. they do not know what to do except line up in front of you. Um, uh, but the better ones are really fine photographic instruments. You know, the great thing about this, these guys is that the lens you know, most, most amateur cameras go to about three feet. You can't get any closer than that. So the closest picture you can take of somebody is from the waist up. This focuses down to nine inches. I can go in and take a picture of your nose, basically. Mm -hmm. And that gives you a flexibility, because, especially because the frame is small. Mm -hmm. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. I'm just talking about it. But the, uh, because the frame is small, you can fill it up with a face or two faces. And because the lens is rather fine and the film is better than people think it is, you get a lot of detail in that face. Mm -hmm. And you also get the peculiar Polaroid color, which when it's on, so is like beautiful. nothing else. It's like nothing else. And you were talking about children and instant cameras. When I give instant cameras to children, it is always Fuji-based. Yes. Because that Fuji film is so saturated and bright in its colors. Fuji red, nothing like Fuji red. <laughs> it's, that is, that's exactly right. If they could you don't need the kids. tulips. No, you don't need the tulips. But that, um, it, kids really respond to the colors in the, the Fuji spectrum. Yeah. You know? And also just the, I mean, the party trick aspect of it, right. where a picture sort of comes out of a mist right in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it worked on kids in 1972 it's or still 1947, magic. and it absolutely is. I always say that if you introduced this stuff now, as an advance on digital photography and told people you get a print on the spot. Mm -hmm. They'd be like, oh, that's, 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 a, that's, that's a newer thing. That's an advance. It's not retro. That's totally great. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a great um, idea. Um, you know, I think uh, that it's easy uh, because of the way Polaroid was marketed. I mean, you think about like the, the ultimately the ones like the one step and the, uh, what's the one with 
Allie McGraw. The swinger. The swinger, right. <laughs> Where she's on the beach, you know, and I'm like, don't drop that in the sand. Uh, it's, but, it's, uh, more than a camera. That's, it's almost alive. It's, that's right. it's only $19.95. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> it's from the jingle. They, they, the jingle, yes. That, but the, it, sadly, you can't really ever Google swinger video. <laughs> you have to put a more description there. <laughs> it doesn't help if you add Polaroid either. <laughs> When I was researching my book, I, I called uh, somebody who, had, who was a, an academic, a historian of pornography. Mm. And I said, how soon did people figure out that you could take dirty pictures without sending them to the lab? And he said, real early. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, like five and, minutes. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's right. You know. right. <laughs> well, I'm sure that that's true. Also, um, Polaroid, <coughs> Polaroids have a personal the film is extremely personal and um, intimate. So I think probably it made sense. Yeah. In addition to, you know, you being like, I'm gonna hide this, I'm gonna hide this dirty thing. I think you also probably got, even in those very early iterations, you got something that was very personal. Probably. I do know that, you know, I mean it was it was safe in a way that, you know, you gotta remember we're talking about the late nineteen forties, you could actually get put in jail. Or having right. a picture of frontal nudity. Um, if you mailed it to somebody, you were committing a federal crime. And if you were caught with it in a public way, you'd be shamed, you know, a thousand times more than you'd be shamed now. Um, so the, the the great sort of joy of it, as much as it was, was that if you gave somebody that picture, that was it. It was yeah. a print, and you could lock it in your. If it was a picture of you, you could lock it in your drawer, and it wouldn't escape which is never true of a digital image. It yeah. can always escape. It can always escape, yeah. that's right. Um, I feel like I want to talk a little bit about what happens after the picture comes out of the camera. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is, uh, we, were, we were talking about this the other day too, you take a million photographs, and out of that million photographs, you have 10 you like, and that you think are worthy. And that is the point of being a photographer who is taking image, right? So, and that is the part that is ineffable. There's no way to understand what makes that image right. We can, we can assign it a million different ways of looking at it. We can be like, it's the, it's, it's this, it's that, it's the composition, it's the color, but it is a much greater thing, and that is the artist represented in that work. And so you get these 10 pictures out of the million that you have taken. And, um, and that's when other me more modern mechanisms come in, in my, in my situation, because now I've got, a, I've got a picture that's that big, and I want that picture <coughs> 50 inches. And so uh, at that point, it becomes part of a more modern mechanism and it's scanned and they are they are printed and how they are printed is always different for every show. These two shows are printed the same, but that is not true of my work. These two shows are, are both archival pr pigment prints. They're on um, Awagami Kozo paper, which is a mulberry paper. And the way the pigment attaches to that paper was suitable for both of these uh, bodies of work, but not suitable for everything. And so I then have a whole other series of decisions to make in presentation. And in every case, no change is made to the picture. So the goal, the ultimate goal for me, is that the picture comes out of the camera and that is what we are always working to. Make it look exactly. Make like it look exactly, and in fact, Brian Matman, who is um, the person who does that mm -hmm. for me with the, and talks the talk to mm -hmm. those people. <laughs> um, you know, it is him saying, make it exactly like that. Mm -hmm. and, and here's what's not, not right yet. Here's what's not right yet. It's because I don't want to change that picture at all. I want, when that picture is right, that's what I want, and I want it to look like that. So that's what these also, um, I think 
in the vitrines, we have a few of the picture books that have gone on. So you'll see that they don't have that color range anymore. These, these pictures are fugitive. Mm -hmm. So that, and, and that is captured at the best point of those pictures. So uh, it, and I find really that the curing process is kind of long. It, you oh, know, yeah, it, 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 it takes a it takes a while for these pictures to settle into what they're going to be. Mm -hmm. So they have to dry really, and that can take a week or two. Yeah, two usually is. I, yeah. I, I try not to look at them again for two weeks because mm -hmm. I'm like they're going to change. Yeah, yeah. Um, I you know I've never asked you this, and I'm curious. There are the ten you love and the ten you know are right. Out of the several hundred, out of a thousand, right. there are nine hundred that you can toss. What do you do with the other yeah. ninety? The ones that are Good, but not magic. I asked Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, did you take a look at these? Did I miss something? Mm -hmm. Did I miss something? You know, like, is there? And sometimes she'll be like, she'll she'll say, I think you missed this one's this one's great, mm -hmm. and I will say, I know that one's not going to print. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Interesting. So, do you keep them? I do. <laughs> anyway, I keep them. Yeah, I know. I keep them. They have to be pretty bad for me to throw them out. Yeah. <laughs> because I do look back at them, and I learn. I mm -hmm. still learn from, from them. Makes sense. And I imagine in this sort of narrative, uh, yeah, I mean, your pictures tell stories when you group them, right? Mm -hmm. So there's probably stories of the day mm -hmm. that stick with you, even if they don't matter to, to sort of your, you know, the viewer of your art, right? right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, to wind this up, I thought something you said to me the other day seemed quite profound. And it's that this medium itself is going to go away. That's right. We're talking about expired materials and very old cameras, and nobody's making them anymore. Mm -hmm. There is film for these cameras being made again, but it's very different. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you've had mixed experiences with it, I think. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's it's a lot better than it used to be. <laughs> it's a lot better than it used to be. Yeah. But the real thing, the Polaroid film made before 2009, which is the last date stamp I have on any of my boxes. Mm -hmm. It is a finite product, mm -hmm. and, and these cameras are also finite. And uh, so this moment in time, this sweet spot that I get to have, that I get to occupy, will go away. And the, that will be sad because of the loss of these of the Polaroid aspect of it, but for me, you know, I, it will become another. It will become another thing. I mean, mm -hmm. that's how artists are. You you work with what you have. You make up something. You make something up. That's, that's what that's, artists do. They make stuff up. They make stuff up. That's right. But I I do re, I do recognize that I am in. I am still in that sweet spot, and I mm -hmm. appreciate it just hugely. And I think um, every time I get to use these cameras and use this film and think of my dead boyfriend. Um, I am really thankful, I am incredibly thankful that his vision is still something I get to work with. Because it is really art from the mechanism. And I, I, I am incredibly thankful that I'm a part of that mechanism as well. You're gonna be the last one. Nobody else is shooting this but a few people. I know, because that's what's, that's what's there. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, there are other people shooting instant film, plenty, and the Fuji stuff and the other kinds, you know, that are out there. Um, but the old Polaroid stuff is in its twilight, and yeah. you're the only person I know who uses it. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I was thinking, I felt really, really sad when Marie died. Mm -hmm. This is Marie Cosindas, who is a photographer who worked in this in this material. She was the first to shoot Polaroid colored film. She got the test packs in 1962 and made pictures that look like nobody else's pictures. Not, I mean, just the, the power of her photography was legion. Yeah. She died about what, two years two ago? Two years ago, yeah. Something like that. But it really hurt. I was like, oh, oh, that, that feels bad. Did you get to know her at all? A, a little bit, a little yeah. Bit, yeah. I went to visit with her a couple yeah. of times, and it was a fascinating experience. Yeah. I took her picture. Wow, with this, in fact. This you bold thing. Well, I, I had an excuse. Oh. I was doing a little project for the people who make Polaroid film, The Impossible Project, uh, and uh, they asked me to shoot a number of the people I interviewed for my book, 
a number of the old Polaroid executives and contributors and people who had been part of the story. So I went to all the houses, all these you know retirees, and, and I went up to Marie's and I said, I want to take your picture, and she said, okay. She was skittish about it. Like many photographers, she disliked having her picture taken. But she It steals the soul. <laughs> she, she loved it. 100%. Um, and, but she said, okay. And then she took over. Because I am not a pro. I, as I said, I'm a snapshot photographer. She was like, wait a minute, where I was standing, wait a minute, no, 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 no. Around to this side. She began to direct. Yeah. And it was, it was you know, I, I felt a little beat up by the end. <laughs> um, and you have to understand that Marie was this tall and at the time 91. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I was not in charge of that photo session. Let me tell you. <laughs> yes. And then she took my picture. Wow, wow. Fantastic. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, shall we call it there? I think so. All right. Thanks for coming. I'd love to ask questions. Oh, of course. Oh. It's a great question, and um, I am I am hell bent for America. I have to say, like I could see, I could see as many places as I could see. Like I would love to take pictures all over the country. Um, I think a little bit about uh, the places that I, I want to go, and then I I am in certain places, and then I sort of dance with who's there. You know what I mean? Like, it, um, but I I really. I would, and I had actually, I'm ready to do another series of nudes. I haven't done that in a while. So I feel like I, I have a different idea about bodies now, so I'd like to do that. Go ahead. Um, is there a project that you've worked on that you feel that you've connected with more than any other project? Is there one that you would just, out, that's an outlier that you call your baby? Hmm. You know, I, I don't know that answer. Uh, I'd have to think about it because um, when it takes me a long time uh, to think about my projects. So uh, partly that is because of the scarcity of the film and w what I'm going to be able to do. So I front load everything with thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it until I, I know what I'm going to, I know what those pictures are going to be like, I know how they're going to. I know where I'm going to situate it. I, if it's a, if it's outside someplace, I know what it's going to look like. Um, Jill was teasing me the other day about the fact that I spent six months um, researching all of the streets in Laredo from Google Maps and mm -hmm. looking at you know placing the little person there and looking up and down the street and trying to make decisions about where I wanted to drive first and this is how I do everything. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> right? like, like you know, like you you don't you don't just because you have this very small amount of film available to you, I mean, relatively speaking, you don't just go out and do it. So to come back to your question, um, sometimes I go through that whole process and then when it's time to work on it, I have something else happening in my life that is affecting it. So sometimes I have a sad thing happening or I have a fantastically wonderful thing happening and that imbues that work with something else, <clears throat> different sensibility than I originally thought was going to happen. And so when I look back at those, I often remember those things. So a sad time is maybe not my favorite set of <laughs> pictures, but that doesn't mean that they're not the best. So I think that's sort of how I, how I look at it. I, I, don't do a, I don't shoot a show. I don't shoot a show a series without really liking it. It's already been winnowed to a place where I already, I love the idea and I really want to do it. I'm anxious to do it. Similarly, do you have a series you feel like got closest to what you were going for? You know, it's, I, I'm not going to say a favorite because it doesn't work like that, I know, but sometimes you feel like, I know this with magazine stories I write, it's like that one got where it was supposed to be. And yeah. This one is most of the way. Yeah, I have one that's called U.X, which is, um, uh, I shot in my bathroom toys. in New York, yeah, and I lit with a, 
um, LED flashlight that I held in my mouth. Mm -hmm. And I had really, it was about the shadows. Mm -hmm. It's all about the shadows. It's all about, it's not, in fact, in most of those pictures, you cannot really see. You're like, what is that little object, that little toy? Mm -hmm. But it is what that shadow casts, and I felt like it, I nailed it. Mm -hmm. Am I allowed to ask a question? If it's not a hard one. <laughs> oh, <okay>. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, I know a little bit more about the scope of your work than is on the walls here, so I'm asking a question that's a little bit outside of what's in this room. Um, but my question has to do with the, uh, the sort of range of your work from abstraction to figuration. And I don't feel like you've ever gone all the way to one extreme or the other, but you do kind of move back and forth. Um, and, and even just in this room, uh, among these five artists, there's, there's an interesting range of, you know, specificity and clarity and abstraction. And, so uh, I just wonder if you can talk a little bit about, and, and in your work, of course, that takes, it's not only conceptual, but it's also realized in some material ways with how you expose and how you handle the lenses in the film. So I just wonder if you can talk a little bit about how that feels to you and where that goes. It's super interesting to me that you ask that. The, I have a real affinity for total abstraction. Mm -hmm. um, and so I chase it down. I definitely chase it down, and I hope that it does appear in most of my work in some way. But when I get all the way to the point where I am now working with a completely abstract object, I don't feel that I'm good enough yet to get it to, get it to where I want it. It's really about that same kind of question that Christopher is asking. Um, I, want, I want to be able to push it more. Like, my abstract mind, I guess, is really far advanced in terms of what I'm looking to get on the film. And it's, it's uh, I would say that, I, I'd say I'm doing B work, and I don't, I, that's not what I want to put out there. I want to put out A plus work, so. I think that that's, I think that's it. Um, it's kind of folded into everything. That it is kind of folded level. into everything. And I think that that's right. You can see it and you can tell that that is, a, that that's a driving force for me. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. You are going to ask a hard question. I know. No. You get people. No, I'm not going to ask a hard question. Um, each of the artists in the show has referenced this kind of sweet spot that they're operating in. And that's something that, in addition to the notion of expiration, has been a kind of through line. I mean, Allison talks about the expired paper, photo paper, and that you know people are getting rid of their dark rooms mm -hmm. and they're coming saying, "I found all this photo, you know, all of this paper." And at some point, will it exist any longer? Um, and you know, the the developer trays. A lot of people aren't using those or processing their film anymore. And Jason talks about um, vernacular photography and how. You know, we in don't 20 it. years, will, will there be these annotations on the back of family photographs? Mm -hmm. And so I wonder in occupying that sweet spot where you're able to make the work that you make because of this particular moment in time and this kind of trajectory, how much of that is feeling kind of gratitude for, for being in this moment in this time when you can do that and the anticipatory anxiety of that window closing? How do you balance those two things? I'm 100% anxious all the time. <laughs> so that's pretty easy. I'm always worried about that, but I know enough to recognize how great it does feel to be able to work with this, with this film at this time. And, um, you, know, I, you know, I can be, I can be anxious about nine million things and it's, it's very, very easy for me, but the, that wide open feeling of getting to use this film and these cameras is a thing that I don't, I don't take lightly. So it is some, those are, you know, you do, it's, I, I always think it's what I call, you know, the freelance exper experience, which is you have a great job now, but what about your next job, you know? <laughs> and, um, and so I do try not to get 
too worried about that. You know, not to be glib, but it, if it were a different time and you didn't have this available, you'd find something that did what yep. you do at that time. You know, it's about materials at a moment, and there will be materials for those moments. Right. Right. So you have to trust that there will be materials. Something for those you'll something that will come. Something will always come along that makes you that interests you. That's right. 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 But I mean, like we were talking about this, and this I get to ask a question, which is, isn't that true that um, you were saying that Ouija could only exist in that sweet spot? Yes, it is. It is true. His particular idiom as a photographer was to shoot for the tabloids in New York in the '30s and '40s, and there was a certain sort of small-scale, hand-gathered news quality back then to the to the. Um, to the New York papers. There were nine dailies, first of all, so he could sell enough into them every day to feed himself and keep his apartment, his awful little apartment around the corner here. Um, it, was, it looked like a prison cell. Um, $17 a month, though, you know, so how many photos do you have to sell, really? Um, and uh, so he had all these outlets, and it was the Depression, so there were um, uh, not a lot of night guys on the staffs of the mm -hmm. papers because they were not, I mean, the Times could keep night people on and the Daily News, which was very rich back then, but the smaller papers couldn't. So he had an opportunity there. And most of all, they were, papers were packed with local crime and fire and car crashes and local small scale news. And you look at the papers of 30 years later and they're writing about Russia or, or uh, the Cold War or Mao. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's much less local news in the papers 30 years later. His his world ceased to exist in a way, you know, and as did the $17 a month apartment. <laughs> a cheap apartment, if you're an artist, is, is a beautiful a thing. Very very important thing to your development. <laughs> That's right. I'm thinking of you, West Death. <laughs> That's right. what it's for. That's what it's for. And That's and what it's, it's for. still what it's for. Hanging on just That's barely. Right. Well, and in some ways, Tony's work speaks to the kind of 21st century obsolescence. Tony's work with the e-readers. These mm -hmm. are the digital um, Kindles from 2008. And by 2010, they corrected it so you actually couldn't burn an image into right. digital ink. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Oh, so this is, that's it then. Yeah. This was this window, but it was a window from 2008 to 2010. And the obsolescence just ramped up. But he also, mm -hmm. he with very 21st century materials, found this mm -hmm. sweet spot it's just that the obsolescence was so rapid, really but it shows that in a way, there's always this, even if you love the notion of expired materials and reanimating them, there are things to reproduce now that might have a year or two window and that's then you right. can go back to those. So it doesn't, sh it doesn't end, it yes. just evolves. That's yeah. right. This is all, it's only tangentially related, but Land used to talk about that. The reason Polaroid was able to innovate as much as it did over and over and over, over 50 years of market dominance was because they locked up their patents early and then they had their first product, the, instant, the camera of 1948, was a hit. So they had cash coming in, which funded the labs, which allowed them to develop the next project with a cushion, which allowed them, which was a hit again. And they, you know, and so they always had money coming in, and they always had enough money to sort of blow on projects that might not work out because one of them would kick out a billion dollars if it scored. And um, you know, that doesn't happen anymore because the tech cycle is so much faster. Um, he used to get 10 or 15 years between product introductions. And, you know, if you have patented a product related to an app or something now, 18 months later, someone's beat you. You don't have enough time to build up the, the cash to develop the next thing. That's right. That's right. Didn't the first camera sell out at Jordan Marsh? It did. On the first introduced, day? Introduced on Black, what we now call Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving. They had, um, they brought 50 cameras to the store, that, no, 60 cameras to the 60, store that yeah. day. And uh, yeah, you had they, thought gonna, they thought I it said, was going to be that'll hold us till Christmas. Christmas yeah. They <laughs> thought it was going to be till Christmas and sold uh, out that day. There's a photograph of the store that day. This is Jordan Marsh Department Store in Boston. Uh, there's a photograph of the crowd at the camera counter with the salesman standing on the counter. <laughs> so, uh, they sold all 60 cameras, plus they had a dummy demonstrator, you know, just propped up, and they, they sold it by mistake. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't, it didn't work. <laughs> That's so funny. Allison, you had your hand up. Oh, it was a nuts and bolts question, and um, has to do with eBay. <laughs> and so are you, um, do you prefer the Polaroid film from the past that you find on eBay? Is that your source? Or are you shooting 
the newer materials that are made by Fuji that fit into your cameras? I um, shoot both? some. I shoot some modern stuff from Impossible, mm -hmm. which is also now called Polaroid Originals. Polaroid Originals. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, the minnow ate the whale. The they minnow, bought Polaroid. They the carcass of Polaroid. They bought the carcass of Polaroid. Um, and Impossible comes from a from a land quote, right, about being ambitious. Don't don't try something if you, it's not unless it is. Uh, ambitious and nearly manifestly impossible. important and nearly impossible. Right, right. right. Nothing's worth doing unless it is ma uh, right. manifestly right. important and nearly impossible. Um, but so I do use I do use some of those. I don't like them as much for color reasons, or um, they are more fugitive even than some of this old Polaroid. Um, but I do, and I do buy on eBay. Um, but I also, you know, I get film from people, which is nice. And yeah, sometimes someone will find two packs of film, like in the back of their closet or in the back of their mom's closet. And um, I love being able to use those. I, they're in my bag, I found them. <laughs> <laughs> I them yeah. so, and so that's good. I also, I bought as much as I possibly could immediately prior to it. Because I'm also old, so that's another benefit, which is um, that I, I could buy the I could buy the I was an adult who could buy the film at that time, right. <laughs> and not have it in a place where the where it's going between 40 and 80 degrees. But you must, I mean, people must give you paper, right? Yeah, it happens. Yes, and it's lovely when it happens. Right. eBay is really my source, mm -hmm. and um, and it is. Finite. It, it's yeah. true. What used to be um, plentiful ten years ago is now. I wait months for something to come about. But um, but I've never looked film. You know the Polaroid materials, and so I wonder how rare that is to find the materials available. Well, um, like Christopher was saying, some of them are pretty hard to lay hands on. Um, if you are looking for 600 film produced in 2009, you probably could find it with some ease. 600 was right. what you buy at your grocery store or your mm -hmm. drug store, you oh, know. Right. So you'd see a lot, you'd see a lot of that. Um, However, the demand is also higher for that, so the prices creep up. The prices so you do. You have to spend real money. Yeah, you have to spend real money on all of these things. Um, and also, the, you know, the cameras, there are cameras that are rare. Um, the one that um, Christopher showed you at the beginning, yeah, that one is really, really hard to find. And if you're finding it, you're paying, you know, quite a bit of money for that, for something that you don't exactly know how what the condition is going to be. Right. You have a guy that fixes, I assume. Yeah. yeah. We all have a guy. There's always a guy, and I'm not telling you who it is. <laughs> <laughs> my my guy's in Wisconsin. That's all I'll say. <laughs> Although the Brooklyn Film Camera people, I now, heard about that. They they have a repair desk. They'll do it for you. Wow. And and it's right here, so I can. Take it over and theoretically. You know, some, some stuff you can do on your own. You know, mm -hmm. some stuff you, you working with these cameras, you do figure that stuff out early. a little bit. Yeah. yeah. All right. Just get up to thank everyone. So I want to thank Christopher and Susan for first entrusting me with her work and being the first artist to jump on board with this idea when it was really just. I told you, I, what Maya said to me was, I'm thinking about thinking about something. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, that is a person I want to follow. It wasn't, she signed on and it wasn't even a legitimate thought, which is a great gift. But I want to thank Christopher for joining us for this conversation and to both of you for you know, helping us nerd out on Polaroid, which I could have listened to this for hours and hours. Thank you all for coming and most of all to Sarah for entrusting me with this yes. space. Yeah. This show is only up for, I think, four more days, so please stay and look and ask questions of Susan and Christopher and Allison if she's willing. Um, I was hard. Um, but t t please take this show in because it's going to disappear, but it will turn into a bigger museum show and will reappear and reanimate itself, just like the, the content. And I also want to point you to Susan cam Susan's cameras in the back, which were really... Brian's great gift. Uh, you'll see um, how they're installed, which is really thanks to our wonderful. It's, it's top of my CD now. It should be. <laughs> I mean, this, this, there was a man named George Magenta, and he personalized his case, and you see a portrait of himself naked in the shower 
revealed by a flap that we, we rigged so that you could see this. Um, but you see her cameras and you see how these, these objects became kind of personal, really intimate possessions. And you see that in the, in the cameras that she's collected and how other people cared for them before they came into her possession. So please go around the corner and see those things because they, they, they're once in a lifetime. It's really, it's really special to see her relationship to her cameras through these objects. Thank you all so much for coming. And thank you, Sarah.